Hello everyone, today we're starting a new series, so let's jump right in. Genetics is the study of genes, genetic variation, and heredity in organisms. Genetics is pivotal to understanding how evolution works, and as such, we've actually talked a bit about genetics in the past, see the mathematics of population genetics, and genetics. The former video discussed dominant versus recessive alleles, and the latter discussed evidence for evolution from the field of genetics. In this new series, much like our paleontology series, we'll be discussing basic concepts in genetics that you'd be introduced to in high school or lower level collegiate courses. We figured, what better place to start in genetics than the molecule responsible for genetics, DNA. DNA is an abbreviation for deoxyribonucleic acid. Despite being one of the most complex molecular structures that we know of, this molecule is composed of only five chemical elements, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and phosphorus. These elements first form the building blocks of DNA, called nucleotides, which are formed from three subunits, a 5-carbon sugar, a phosphate group, and a nitrogenous base. Nucleotides are a type of monomer, an organic molecule that can link together in large quantities to produce chain-like molecules called polymers. When they do, the resulting polymer is referred to as a polynucleotide or a DNA strand. When two complementary DNA strands form hydrogen bonds between their respective nitrogenous bases, they form a double helix structure, a shape that looks like a twisted ladder. This is the most common form of DNA, and the term DNA is most often used to refer to this specific structure. We'll get into exceptions to this later. In ribonucleic acid, which is abbreviated as RNA, the 5-carbon sugar is called ribose. To form DNA, an oxygen atom is removed from the sugar, that's why its sugar is deoxyribose. Next, the phosphate group is a phosphorus atom bonded to four oxygen atoms. The phosphate groups connect two ribose sugars with phosphodiester bonds and form the sides of the DNA ladder. It's important to note that the way the phosphate groups bond to the sugar on each end aren't identical to each other. Free nucleotides have the phosphate attached at the 5' prime carbon of the sugar, and this is then connected to the 3' prime carbon of the next nucleotide. As a result of this, a DNA strand has a 5' prime end that has a phosphate group attached to the 5' prime carbon of the sugar, and a 3' prime end that has a hydroxyl group attached to the 3' prime carbon. In a double helix, the complementary strands run anti-parallel to each other with regard to their 5' prime and 3' prime ends. So, in a way, one side of the DNA ladder is built upside down. Lastly, the nitrogenous bases, the rungs of the DNA ladder, connect to each other via hydrogen bonds. There are five bases, adenine, cytosine, guanine, thymine, and uracil, which are often abbreviated by the first letter of their chemical names. Thymine exists in DNA, and uracil is its counterpart in RNA. Adenine and guanine are purines, while cytosine, thymine, and uracil are pyrimidines. Adenine bonds to thymine, or uracil, and cytosine bonds to guanine, so a purine always bonds with a pyrimidine. If DNA has nitrogenous bases, then why is it called a nucleic acid? At physiological pH, the phosphate groups uh, actually deprotonate, but the nucleobases don't protonate, so the net contribution is acidic. That's why it is called an acid. Most people are familiar with the double helix structure of DNA, as it's often seen as the symbol for the field of genetics itself. But a less well-known fact about the double helical structure is that it occurs in different conformations. There are three of them that are found in nature. The most common form is dubbed the B-type or B-DNA. The helix of B-DNA is right-handed. There are also spaces between the sugar phosphate backbones that are called grooves. B-DNA has a wide major groove and a narrow minor groove. The other types are A-DNA and Z-DNA. A-DNA is similar to B-DNA, as it is right-handed and also has different major and minor grooves. However, the helix of A-DNA has a larger width and is compressed along its axis. The major groove is narrow and deep, while the minor groove is wide and shallow. 
Dehydration drives the reconfiguration of B DNA into the A form. In a paper from 2014, Whelan et al. documented their observation that bacteria protect their DNA by turning it into A DNA in response to extremely dry conditions. Z DNA, on the other hand, is left handed as the helix twists in the opposite direction, which is made possible when the backbone of both strands form a zigzag pattern. The major and minor grooves of it are almost indistinguishable. Z-DNA is a transient structure and not very stable. A segment of B-DNA can turn into Z-DNA under certain physiological conditions, forming two B-Z junctions, and then relaxing back to the stable B-DNA form. One of such conditions is negative supercoiling that's generated during transcription. The formation of Z-DNA is thought to relieve the torsional strain caused by such processes. So while DNA is usually double-stranded, RNA is usually single-stranded. Viruses can contain either DNA or RNA, both of which can be either double or single-stranded. Triple-stranded DNA and four-stranded G-quadruplex or G4 DNA exist too, but not much is known about these. G4 DNA is formed by strands rich in guanine, hence the name. It can be formed from four separate strands, but also by two or even one long strand that loops and folds back onto itself, forming the structure. Triple-stranded DNA is formed when the third strand binds in the major groove of a double-stranded B DNA. There is some evidence that triple-stranded DNA plays a role in the regulation of certain genes, as shown in the 1994 paper, Triplex Forming Ability of a Semic Promoter Element Predicts Promoter Strength. Triple-stranded and quadruple-stranded structures can also occur as three-way and four-way junctions, respectively, which branch out into normal double-stranded DNA. A four-way DNA junction is more often referred to as a Holiday junction in honor of molecular biologist Robin Holiday, who proposed its existence in 1964. Holiday junctions are involved in the process of genetic recombination, which will be covered in another video of this series. Back to the nitrogenous bases. When their sequence codes for a molecular product that has some function, they're known as genes. Some genes code for proteins, some only produce RNA, such as transfer RNA genes, and others have lost their original protein and or RNA coding functions, or they no longer have any function at all. These are known as pseudogenes. As humans, we have around 21,000 genes, but don't think that having more genes correlates with being more complex. The rice, or Riza sativa, has between 30,000 and 50,000 genes. The same is true of genome size. Our genome has around 3.2 billion base pairs, while the genome of Amoeba proteus has some 670 billion base pairs. This curious observation is part of a problem that is known as the C-value enigma, which will get more attention in another video. Now, while there isn't a question about the structure of DNA today, you must understand that this had to be studied for decades by researchers before the full structure was worked out. Back in 1869, Swiss doctor Frederick Miescher isolated a chemical from the nucleus of leukocytes that he called nuclein. Analyses of the substance indicated that it contained large amounts of phosphorus, but not sulfur, and couldn't be digested by protease, meaning it wasn't a protein. It also wasn't a lipid, leading Miescher to realize that he had discovered a novel molecule. At one point, he even speculated that the molecule might play a role in the transmission of hereditary traits, but he later rejected the idea. Fortunately, there was no Nobel Prize back then for Miescher to have regretted not winning. A decade later, German biochemist Albrecht Kossel determined that nucleins were acidic and composed of five nucleobases. The term nucleic acid wouldn't be coined, however, until 1889 by German pathologist Richard Altman. In 1909, American biochemist Phoebus Levine determined that the sugar in RNA, which was called yeast nucleic acid at the time, was a pentose. In addition, he and his team discovered that each nucleotide monomer consists of phosphorus, a pentose, and a nucleobase. In 1927, Russian biologist Nikolai Koltsov propose that hereditary traits are recorded in giant double-stranded molecules that reproduce in semi-conservative fashion. This is not the only discovery Koltsov is known for, as he learned that the cell is structured by a cytoskeleton earlier in 1903. Unfortunately for him, the rise of communism in Russia dealt a fatal blow to genetics, as well as many geneticists, as the field became politicized to the point where communist Trofim Lysenko claimed genetics and Darwinian evolution generally to be 
bourgeois sciences. That's another lesson on the dangers of dogmas trying to dictate science. But back to the story. In 1904, British bacteriologist Frederick Griffith found through experiments with the bacterium Streptococcus pneumoniae, formerly called pneumococcus, that DNA is the carrier of hereditary traits. Those experiments involved the horizontal gene transfer method called transformation, which we will return to in a later video. All this work took a while, research in 1943 by Avery, McLeod, and McCarty, and in 1952 by Hershey and Chase, eventually confirmed Griffith's conclusions. By then, there was a race to figure out the structure of DNA. Stoichiometric work by Astbury and Bell in 1938 showed that DNA has a regular structure, and, working off X-ray images taken by Rosalind Franklin and Maurice Wilkins, James Watson and Francis Crick finally detailed the double helix structure of DNA. Watson, Crick, and Wilkins received the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1962, but because Franklin died in 1958, she received no prize. Watson suggested that she should receive the Nobel Prize in Chemistry posthumously, but the prize community does not award people posthumously, and would not bend the rules in Franklin's case. But we can still give her the recognition that she deserves. There you have it. It took almost a century for researchers to determine the structure and function of DNA. In the next videos of this series, we'll be looking at some of those functions. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.